Good morning. Happy uh, Friday. Yes, it's definitely Friday morning. I am recording this lecture for you from my panic room uh, at home. And uh, as usual on these Fridays, we're going to be doing case studies, case studies that I feel exemplify what we have seen in our material throughout the week. So this uh, Friday, the case study is Syria, the Syrian civil war. Um, I highly suspect this is something that everybody has heard of, or at least been tangentially aware of, and, and has likely been discussed in various other classes that you may have taken, especially if you major in, in anything related to the social sciences. How on earth did Syria come to this? That's the big question. Um, and what we're going to see ultimately is that Syria, to me, when I analyze or, or try to learn about the Syrian catastrophe, what I am seeing is the confluence of many types of war and international global trends that that we you know discussed over the last couple of days. And also it exemplifies one new element we didn't really talk about. But I suspect it might be the number one cause of future conflicts going forward in the next 30 years, right? So we've been talking about this 30 year post Cold War period. What are the next 30 years? What is the world gonna look like over 2020 to 2050? Um, that is, is, is a question that I think Syria uniquely speaks to, and I'll come to that towards the end of class. Um, let's first establish the basics. What you're seeing on the right here, the bottom right, is the conflict map as of today, as of October 2020. Um, and Syrian, the Syrian civil war has been occurring since uh, 2011, so we're, we're coming up on an almost decade-long civil war with multiple sides. So anything you see in the map in red or, or pink, whatever color that that, come, that appears to be to you, that is territory controlled by the regime. It's significantly more than what they had even just a few years ago. Anything yellow is uh, ruled by the Kurds, uh, which is in um, sort of a long oppressed ethnic group in multiple countries within the Middle East. You find the Kurds in Iraq, you find the Kurds in Turkey, and you find the Kurds in Syria. Uh, anything in orange is sort of a classically autonomous region of northern Syria. They are parts of the country that the regime really didn't rule even before the civil war, and they certainly don't rule it now. And anything in green is what the opposition controls. It's not a ton left. There's a couple of other things here. Um, due to splintering in opposition and, and uh, insurgent groups, um, some are no longer allied with the main opposition group of the Free Syrian Army, and that's what you see down here in like purple, blue over here. Those are opposition groups in um, kind of an active reconciliation with the government. Uh, and anything you see in gray, which is almost nothing, but if you follow my mouse here, my cursor, you can see that there's a tiny little gray area right there. That's area controlled by ISIS, but they don't, they don't hold much of Syria anymore. They've mostly been eliminated as a land power. And when it comes to the rivalries here, what you're seeing on the left here is um, the, at, at least as I understand it, it's the various geopolitical and, and military conflicts that exist. You can see that when the Islamic State was active, everybody mostly was against the Islamic State. If you are um, wondering what those question marks mean for the Syrian government, right, what, what I have... When I put this together, anything in green, green arrows are ally relationships. Yellow is it's kind of unclear and it's it's a very contingent relationship, like a contingent upon the moment. And anything in red is active hostilities. With Russia and the Syrian government, it's generally believed that they certainly didn't support ISIS and the Islamic State. But it's likely that those... Um, groups felt that the chaos that the Islamic State brought would equally, like the damage that they caused would be equally distributed against the uh, opposition, right? The, the the formal opposition or what we call the Free Syrian Army uh, as opposed to the regime. So, you know, I it, they kind of turned a blind eye in certain areas, even if they were never going to tacitly support ISIS. So you can see that, the, you know, the United States is... Um, kind of supporting, like it was tacitly supporting the rebels and Iran and Russia kind of tacitly support, or openly, pardon me, supported the Syrian government. Iraq got a little bit involved and Hezbollah got a little bit involved and 
uh, it's a mess. It's very complicated. You don't have to write down all of these power relationships here. Um, I just want you to be aware of just how splintered this conflict has become. And the toll of it is probably a lot worse than you realize. So what I want you to do here, just in your head, try to come up with um, how many, what, what do you think has been the cost here in terms of deaths within Syria? And in terms of refugees, both internally displaced refugees and international refugees that have gone to places like Turkey and Germany, other parts of Western Europe. And the answer is, like, we're talking about over half a million people have been killed, most believe. Anywhere between at the low end, 384,577,000 ,000 people lost their lives directly in the Syrian civil war. Seven and a half million people have been internally displaced from the places they live, mostly due to urban and, and city uh, destruction. And five and a half, or five point, a little over five million people have fled the country and are probably never coming back. Um, those people are gonna probably just settle in Britain or in Germany or in Austria or Sweden permanently. Um, the question is no longer, what is Syria going to look like? The, the question is, like, what, what is going to be left of Syria for the victors to rule once this is all said and done? And it is probably wrapping up, um, which um, when a war ends, certain things happen, uh, but nothing that can't be analyzed or undone giving enough, given enough time. So the question will be, like, for at least these people, um, do these people ever come back to Syria and do they contribute to its rebuilding? I highly suspect that the answer to that question will be no. Let's start with like, let's try to understand where this began. And I want to engage with a variable that hasn't been talked about uh, a lot, um, but in academic circles, it's usually um, understood to be the real flashpoint here. Like when the, when the Syrian uprising began, it was an unexpected piece of the Arab Spring. Nobody thought Syria was going to be especially challenged or, or, or touched by the Arab Spring, which began in 2011, you know, toppled the dictator in Egypt, led to regime change in Tunisia. Nobody thought Syria would be seriously threatened. And nobody really paid attention to Syria anyway before that. People always looked at it as a fairly grim example of Middle Eastern autocratic stability. It had been ruled by Assad for the Assad family for many decades. It was a staunch ally of Russia. It had no real antagonistic or, or reasons to be antagonistic with the United States. So it was generally ignored by, by uh, American presidents. Nobody, nobody gave a crap about Syria. It just wasn't anybody's concern. And we also thought it was stable in a way that I guess we we misjudged. I say we, I was not actively involved in research at this point, but but but, but people do appear to have um, misjudged how stable Syria was capable of being. So what changed? Well, in the lead up to the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring was the moment where we paid attention, but it wasn't the moment when we should have paid attention. The moment we should have paid attention was from 2006 to 2011 when Syria suffered what uh, is believed to be the region's worst drought in 900 years. They're able to test this and figure this out by looking at the rings that have grown in trees and you can sort of figure out how moist or how uh, wet a certain region was in, in, in a particular historical period. Um, the worst drought in 900 years, um, that led to a process that ecology uh, experts call desertification. Parts of the Middle East are very prone to desertification for a variety of reasons. But the number one reason is that these are areas that get generally, they're, they're areas of, of, of very long and dry summers with brief wet periods. So much of the Middle East gets all their yearly rainfall in just a couple of months. And if there's a drought there, it's just catastrophic, right? These are areas that rely upon water and yet get very little of it. But they don't, but they're historically not the most water stressed regions of the world because in that type of a region, you would generally see, um, like if you're living, the nomadic people of Saudi Arabia, for example, the Bedouins, they have all sorts of cultural norms and practices that have developed in direct response to long term water shortage. 
Siri's got no 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 expertise in that. And it also got kind of rich where people expect to live a middle class life. So desertification sets in and that is a vicious cycle, right? The more it sets in, the more areas start to turn from lusher parts of the ecosystem into deserts. And so what you're seeing on this map here, agricultural abandonment, places in northern Syria where people used to make a living through agriculture, they no longer can and their farms fail. They cannot water their crops. 75% of Syrian farms fail during this period. Three out of every four Syrian farms fail as people just losing their livelihoods. 85% of the livestock dies usually as a result of dehydration and starvation on their end as well because you can't grow the things that you feed to your livestock and you don't have any water for them. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna water. You're gonna you're gonna let your um, you know let your livestock drink, or are you gonna drink? You know, people have to make these decisions in droughts, and that then leads to a mass a mass transition of the population in Syria that also collided with another serious problem in the Middle East, and that was the civil war that was currently raging in Iraq during this time period. So not only do Syrians from rural areas start flooding into cities because it's the only place they can go and maybe make a living, you also have a lot of international refugees from Iraq that are trying to leave a country that is completely falling apart. And where do they end up? Well, they don't end up in that northern part of Syria that's undergoing drought. They end up in cities as well. And so what this does, it adds a couple million people to Syrian cities and turns them into complete political tinderboxes. And it's all sorts of people that need to be provided for in some way. They need a place to sleep. They need work. They need, you know, some type of social support. And that then collides with the political apparatus of the Syrian state. Now, you've likely at least heard of this guy, if not recognize his picture. It's Bashar al-Assad. He has been the longtime president of Syria. He is the son of uh, the dictator who kind of took control of Syria back in the 60s or 70s, whenever that was. Um, you know, the, who his father was is not important. What is important is that he was never supposed to be running the country in the first place. His brother was the heir apparent to the Syrian regime. But his brother was killed in a car accident and it left dad with no successor. And in his desire to keep the regime and control of the country and the family, attention turned to uh, Bashar al-Assad, who was not particularly engaged in politics. He was actually going to med school and ended up earning a medical degree and practicing in the United Kingdom, but came home to run the country and to learn the family business, so to speak, in the aftermath of his brother's um, untimely death. And so what Assad did was start awarding well rights, like drilling wells heavily along political lines. You see this in autocracies quite a bit. You have to give out favors to the people that support you. Otherwise, you'll never maintain support of the country um, and control of the country. So all these farmers have to drill illegal wells, and that leads to a government crackdown. And that collides with another fact of life in Syria, which is that it's already ruled by a minority group. Syria is an example of a country where a minority ethnic group like has control of all the key political positions of power. And that is an ethnic angle to this that um, not enough people at the time paid attention to. That when a majority a group is being oppressed on various political areas, that can lead to real simmering resentments. And you don't know what exactly is going to cause that to, to go up in flames. Now, the data on this in Syria is hard to come by. The data I am showing here is from 1976. It's the last time that Syria had a census, so I can't get you know more updated data. Um, but it's telling, and much of this has not changed you know really too much over this time period. Um, Syria's official name, like if you look up its at the name at the like the UN, it's called the Syrian Arab Republic, and therefore, right? It 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 you would think it's all 100% Arab, and that's just not true. It is majority Arab though. And, and the control is by the minority Alawite sect, which is a sect, a small minority sect of Shiite Islam. Remember I said that, that's gonna become important in a minute. 
only 8% of the country is um, Alawi, only 8%. And um, most of them live along the Mediterranean coast. So Syrian politics and, and the military and all their institutions have become kind of concentric circles of political um, preference and privilege. You have all of the major cabinet positions, government positions, um, military positions coming from this Alawite sect. And then surrounding that is a kind of a, a, a secondary group of privileged Shiite Muslims and privileged Christians that, that generally dominate. And then on the far outskirts, the Sunni Muslims, and then way, 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 way on the outskirts is the Kurds, who nobody wants in the Middle East anyway. Um, Alawites have really dominated the government and the public sector for decades. And this is not something that people realized was going to be a problem, but it's one of the enduring lessons of the Arab Spring. It's really hard to get people power when all the positions are not controlled by the people of, the, of that same ethnic group. Um, and that showed up quite heavily in the protests. We know this was climate motivated and drought motivated because the protests, like what started the protests? The protests started because a couple children got killed um, by, sold, by government soldiers. That was the spark. But they also blew up in drought regions. That was really the part of the country that you saw the protests beginning. Eventually it just spiraled out of control. Um, but it's not a surprise that this started in the drought regions and Assad went for a very heavy handed crackdown. And what can happen in places where the military is ordered to carry out massacres against its own, you know, its own people, the military will not always obey those orders. And so in the Middle East, like what, what we saw in certain countries, um, soldiers have to make tough decisions. Like, are they going to turn their guns and their weapons on people of the same ethnic group as them, like their own fellow people? that's harder for them to do. If you pull that trigger, you got to live with the consequences of that for the rest of your life. But in Syria, what you had was soldiers, everybody really drawn from this Alawite sect, now having to crack down against a Sunni Muslim majority in the country that they just do not identify with. And they had no problem pulling the trigger in that circumstance. So that leads to a series of massacres. And that created a split within the army. The army is always the most powerful institution in the Middle East. You almost have to ask their permission to do just about anything. Six of the army's 18 divisions, this is when it really becomes a civil war. Six of the army's 18 divisions defect and they form what is known as the Free Syrian Army. And that's generally the opposition that's still soldiering on today in, in a very splintered way. Um, the insurgents here, you may remember back in 2012 or 2013, you may remember Obama's plan to arm the moderates. Look, the problem in a civil war is that after enough time passes, there are no moderates left anymore. Civil war, like the poisonous and, and the destructive nature of civil war, it does one of two things. Either the moderates get killed quick or the moderates become extremists through the process of being in a civil war, you know, being in a broken, failed state and failed civil order for a long period of time. And just after a while, like, you just can't really tell who's who anymore. But it's not really that simple, right? Because what I'm setting up here is like, oh, well, now we have a civil war. We have the Syrian regime and we have the... Um, uh, the Free Syrian Army, the opposition, and, and that looks like a fairly classic civil war, and it isn't. It's just not, not, not even in the slightest. All sides are attracting really serious international support here, and that is the genesis of that really complicated cross arrow map I showed on my first slide here, where you can see that all right, Russia is involved, and Iran is involved, and Hezbollah involved, and you got the U.S. over here, and you got um, ISIS over here, and Al Nusra, and, you know, and and so this is where it becomes a good example of a proxy war. Countries that want to either curtail other countries' power or kind of play out an old grudge with that country, get involved in places where society's falling apart. 
So the United States led some support among Europe uh, to very tacitly support the opposition. No boots on the ground outside of military advisors, but they were going to guard oil wells in the northern Kurdish part is one of the things I remember. Um, I do remember the red line, Obama's famous red line of um, chemical weapons, which, which Assad did use against his own people many, many times over, uh, called that a red line. Um, turns out it's more of a pink line or a magenta line, something off. It's not really the bright red line that we thought it was. Um, and then on the Syrian side, the regime was heavily supported, uh, often with military, with soldiers, um, by the Iranians, by the Russians, and tacitly by the Chinese. The Chinese never, ever put boots on the ground, but they made it clear that they were going to back Assad uh, for reasons that will become clear in a minute. So why do you support these regimes? Well, Russia, you got to understand, Russia doesn't have a lot of allies. Count up the uh, countries that identify as strong allies of Russia. Syria did not want to lose or pardon me, Russia did not want to lose one, uh, one of the major ones that they had. For starters, they had this also gave them access to a port on the Mediterranean, and, and that's important to them. Um, but also arms deals. The Russians uh, have made a lot of money selling arms, selling gas, selling all sorts of things uh, to supply the Russian or the uh, Syrian um, regime. From Iran's position, Iran always feels like they're the leaders of the Shiite faith within the region. And while Syria is not a Shiite country, it was functionally ruled by Shiite Alawites for a very long period of time. Um, and so the belief was, well, if the opposition, if the Sunnis take over this country, then you have yet another ally of Saudi Arabia in the area, and that's that is that's Iran's uh, personal red line. And also China, China just sort of viewed this as a region to upset the apple cart, or as as a, as an opportunity to turn the apple cart over and say, well, we can kind of combat Western influence, but also one of the big one of the big things that China promised to the Syrian regime is like, look, we're not going to help you win this war, but when you do, you let the Russians and the Iranians help you win this war. But when you do, we'll be there to lend you money to rebuild your country because it's pretty obvious to anybody who can look around that this country is completely destroyed. Um, so China China saw an opportunity to get a debt client, I, th I think, and, and, and get construction contracts for Chinese companies. Um, it's one of those things. Uh, war, war is sometimes boring. Sometimes it's just about arms deals and uh, construction companies, um, which is a sad state of affairs. But uh, there's a lot of money to be made rebuilding a country once you destroy it. And uh, the Chinese are not alone in trying to do this. When the United States invaded Iraq, uh, led the coalition to invade Iraq in 2003, um, a ton of no-bid contracts were then given out to Halliburton, which not coincidentally was the major contracting and, and military construction company that was previously run by Dick Cheney during his time out of office. So I don't know, take that for what it is. Uh, yeah, the other big thing though, to get into resources here, what's the other big reason to wanna to be involved in Syria? Syria was a major oil producer. And then all of a sudden it wasn't because when Syria broke, it really stopped producing oil. Um, ISIS actually took control of a lot of their oil for a time frame and, and started selling it to places like Turkey. Um, and so if you look at this graph here, Syrian oil production from 2008, all right, so that's a time well before the Civil War to then 2018. Look at what has happened here, like a complete decline uh, in the uh, production of oil. And so anybody, like this is the regime's lifeline. Once it got cut off from its ability to make money off of oil. Once it gets cut off from that, all of a sudden you end up with a situation where uh, whoever is controlling Damascus now is going to control a tremendous amount of oil revenue. And um, that creates a real resource incentive to capture what's known as the rent in the country. Um, you know, you don't have to write that down, but but to, to take control of the oil. And that part I think is really is, is really very understandable. And then all of a sudden, because you can't have a raging civil war without the state eventually failing, um, the state does eventually fail. We'll talk about this more next week, but um, a failed state refers to a country that has lost the ability to provide even the most basic, basic living standards for its citizens. And so the new mess that steps into this element is called ISIS. And that you've probably heard about, even if you didn't know the Syrian drought.
And ISIS treats this as kind of a land war, right? They take cities and they hold land and they start selling oil and they create courts. ISIS stitched together a mini state where one had previously collapsed. And this was an uncomfortable thing. Like it's uh, Syria or the ISIS was able to control territory far more effectively than anybody else in the region could. And the people who suffered overwhelmingly Syrian civilians, but definitely Syrian minorities, right? Anybody who wasn't Sunni is Muslim. That's where all those horrible videos of executions and you know where all that stuff came from. Don't forget though, I wanna come back to this. Don't forget the entire damn thing started with a drought. And that, I do wonder if that's going to be the major lesson 30 years from now we take away from Syria. When we forget about ethnic oppression and we forget about the proxy conflicts that played out on the ground, what we might look back on, say Syria shows you that the number one thing that, listen closely to this, be careful. The number one thing that might cause conflict going forward might be climate change. And I personally view climate change as the number one, not the only, but the number one threat to global stability over the rest of our lifetimes. So do not forget the whole thing started with a drought. And Syria is meaningful here because as I, I started by saying this, I, nobody thought this would happen in Syria, nobody. And so what I'm quoting here, not I'm not trying to like make the magazine here look stupid at all. No, I, I'm just like, this is how everybody felt at the time. We thought that Syria was stable. And so the direct quote, demonstrations in Syria are unlikely to pick up anywhere near serious momentum to seriously threaten the regime. Oops. Um, and then Syria became the most spectacularly failed state within the region. So to recap here, the Syrian crisis, it is many conflicts wrapped into one utterly explosive war. Um, so how does this connect, right? You should be able to see how this connects to everything that we've kind of gone through in class already. Um, oh, pardon me, let me go forward. It's a land war, at least as far as ISIS is concerned, and the Kurds as well. The Kurds really tried to consolidate their... Um, uh, control over over uh, the traditional homeland they have in northern Syria. It's in many ways a resource war, right, for control of the oil and for control of, of, of various contracts. It's definitely an example of ethnic warfare when you consider the ethnic uh, rivalries that that have always existed in the Middle East. Um, and then proxy, it's a proxy war, right? It's Iran, it's the United States, it's the Gulf Council, it is um, Russia um, trying to make sure that their guy comes out on top. But most of all, and most importantly, my biggest fear I think we might look back on this and say it was a climate change war. And Syria demonstrates how all of these things that we've talked about previously, climate change can really magnify that. It becomes what we think of as a, as a, as a threat magnifier. It takes every threat that previously existed and makes it worse. It makes it harder to deal with and it makes it all the more dangerous. So where does this go from here? Well, Assad has effectively won the civil war. But again, now, now Syria will be a dependent, debt-trapped, tense region for the next century. And that's a sad state of affairs. Anyway, have a great rest of your day. Um, Ohio State, Penn State on Friday, on um, uh, Saturday night. Let's go Bucks. See you guys on Friday, on uh, Monday. Bye-bye.